When you saw the title of this talk, What Healthcare Needs to Learn from Tourism, I'm sure a few of you were thinking, yes, finally, margaritas in the waiting room, great idea. The rest of you probably thought it was a little bit unfair that healthcare is too serious to be compared to tourism. But before you go down that path, just consider this. If a restaurant kills just one customer by food poisoning, if a spa accidentally locks just one romantic couple in the sauna for a couple weeks, if a hotel accidentally lets the roof collapse on just one conference, it'll probably shut down the entire place, it goes bankrupt, everyone loses their jobs. However, if a patient dies in the hospital, the hospital's not gonna get shut down. If they could die from a medical mistake, the hospital's not gonna get shut down. Chances are no one's gonna lose their job, Okay, that may not be the fairest comparison, but according to the British Medical Journal, medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the US. Seriously, the third leading cause of death, right behind heart disease and cancer. So the tourism industry would have a pretty strong case to say, they don't want to be compared to healthcare. Just saying. Now, let's put some things in perspective. The definition of healthcare has been expanding for some time. It used to be what happened in a little room between a doctor and a patient. Then the likes of Florence Nightingale put nursing on the map. Sigmund Freud brought in mental health care. Mary McMillan ushered in physical therapy. These days, healthcare can begin before you even treat anybody. Like if you call emergency services because of an accident, they'll probably tell you to put pressure on a wound until the paramedics arrive. It can extend after healthcare as well. If you've just had major surgery, they'll tell you when you go home to not drink or smoke or do strenuous exercise for days or weeks while you recover. And now with virtual medicine, healthcare may no longer even be bound by geography. But today, I want to extend the definition of healthcare just a little bit more. A minor adjustment that could have an enormous global impact. But before I do, let me just clarify, I believe in science-based medicine, and I believe it's absolutely essential. I believe that, but I won't be covering it today, because as a tourism advisor, I'm not qualified. And in many ways, you know, that's just the base expectation. They expect with modern medicine, you're going to get better, not worse, and not accidentally die in the hospital. It's like when you book a hotel. You know, you think you're going to get a toilet, a bed, and a roof over your head. You're not going to praise the hotel for it. You're not going to get to your room, look around, pick up the phone, call the reception, and go, oh my God, there's a bed in my room. You guys are amazing. You're blowing me away. <laughs> it just doesn't work like that. So as I was saying, I want to expand healthcare, and I want to do it in this way. I think it needs more customer service. Now, I'm not talking about putting little chocolates on the pillows, and I'm not even talking about putting those little bamboo umbrellas in the drinks. I'm not even talking about what some private clinics and hospitals do, which is small little bonuses that are going to improve their visitor satisfaction or patient satisfaction surveys and improve their loyalty programs. I'm talking about smart customer service that actually improves healthcare, public or private. In fact, I imagine there's almost no medical investment a hospital or clinic could make today that's going to be as cost effective to provide better health care than what I'm about to show you. Because what I'm about to show you is free and nearly free and easy to implement. So before you upgrade your lab equipment or buy another expensive piece of equipment, please consider the low hanging fruit of what I'm about to share. In fact, one example of this smart customer service has already been widely accepted by the medical community and it's as good health care. You've probably heard of it, bedside manners. It wasn't enough for only the nurses to be nice and show empathy. Evidence-based research showed that the doctors needed to divert their valuable time away from treating patients and looking at lab results to actually listening, showing empathy, and developing a rapport with the patients. Even medical started teaching future doctors to be better at this form of customer service because it provided better overall health care. Now, the real question should be is, what other types of customer service could have these sort of results? Because it can't possibly be only bedside manners. So let's look into this. One key place to look is a sort of evidence, that re sort of service that reduces prolonged stress and anxiety. Why? Because study after study links stress and anxiety to a slower recovery. Wounds actually heal slower. Your immune system is less effective. In fact, according to the Journal of the American Medical Association, most doctor visits are connected to stress. So reducing stress and anxiety is good for healthcare. Now, when it comes to reducing stress and anxiety, that's what the tourism industry 
my industry does perhaps better than any other. We have the world's best hotels, spas, restaurants, and I regularly advise them on how to improve their customer service. So today, I want to borrow four key ideas from this industry, my industry, and show how they can be strategically implemented in healthcare. Now, let's start with visual information. The percentage of the general public that actually has a, a phobia of doctors is very small, but many, many more people are understandably nervous about surgical procedures. And by and large, we're nervous about the unknown. And that anxiety may keep us from sleeping and may keep us worried for days or weeks before that procedure. Now, providing visual information is one thing that the tourism industry does very well. Like, consider when you book a hotel and you go to your favorite search engine or booking site and you click on any hotel, it's going to give you dozens, if not hundreds, of nice images of that hotel. You'll get to see everything the lobby, the bar, the rooms, the beach, the kids' area, the pool. And all that kind of puts you at ease. We know what we'll be getting, right? Now, if you just go across the street and look inside the Karolinska Hospital at the cafe there, you'll also find dozens of images online of the food that they serve, the people pouring coffee, the entire seating area, and all that also kind of puts you at ease. You see what the experience will be like. But if you look up Karolinska's cardiology clinic, that world-class department just a few floors above the cafe, and you hit images, you're not going to get much at all. A few random pictures of people like passed out laying on the ground and others doing surgery, nothing really to put you at ease. In fact, you could easily say that those pictures are going to cause you more stress. Now, it shouldn't really be hard to fix. Imagine getting an email confirmation for your surgery that has a link with some photos of the clinic, the waiting room, the staff, maybe a nice little walkthrough video. All that can be done in 10 minutes for free on anyone's smartphone. And a smartphone solution may be part of the next two concepts as well, because the more I dug and looked for things that are causing stress to patients, the more I found parking in waiting rooms kept coming up. I had no idea how common stress parking was, right? Article after article show that this was a really common occurrence. And this one blew my mind. These cancer patients found that hospital parking was more stressful than dealing with their cancer. Now imagine you show up just 20 minutes before your procedure, but then it takes you 30 minutes to find a spot to park. That's going to stress you out. I remember coming to visit someone before their surgery. I was there a half hour in advance, took me 40 minutes to park, and I was stressed out by that. And it's hardly an isolated incident. And that's one of the reasons why more and more hospitals are starting to provide valet parking for patients during their surgeries. And some are even offering it for free. Here in the Stockholm region, they're even providing some free transportation options to some cancer patients. We're going in the right direction. But it doesn't even have to be that fancy. Imagine in that confirmation email, you get a link showing a digital map, shows you exactly where to park, how much it's going to cost, how to pay for it. They could even give you a little attachment there that you can download with a QR code or barcode that you could print out at home, put on your dashboard, and it provides free parking. There's loads and loads of easy solutions. And when it comes to the waiting room, Patients seem equally stressed. A quick search turned up dozens of articles, including this one, The Waiting Room, Where the Suffering Begins. Now, there's a reason that hotels spend considerable money to make lobbies attractive. It's a first impression that puts guests at ease. I'm not saying you need to spend billions on some kind of a waiting room makeover like this, but I think we can do better than this, right? A small investment will clearly have benefits. I'm talking about comfortable chairs, a little kid's waiting area, maybe some free Wi-Fi. There's already evidence that shows up to 25% of the overall satisfaction experience in healthcare comes from the design and the decor. Plus, what sort of message does it send to patients when you can't even keep your plants alive? If patients need to wait, you have their phone number. Send them a link that lets them check the status of the wait. They'll feel that you haven't forgotten about them, and they'll be less likely to hassle your staff for updates. It's a clear win-win. And here's one last tip from the tourism industry that we've learned long ago, one that builds on that whole bedside manners concept. It's really just basic good service communication. Let's start with greeting people. In tourism, there's something that's called the 10-5 rule. That's in feet. In meters, it'd be more like the 3-1 rule. And it works like this. If you pass within three meters of someone in the hallway, look up from what you're doing, make eye contact, give them a nice nod or a smile. If you pass within one meter of them, just add a little verbal communication to that. Hi or good morning or whatever feels natural. 
Why do we do that? Because it makes people feel welcome. It makes them feel seen and it puts them at ease. It's not just common sense, it's also scientifically based. There's something called mirror neurons. We have this tendency to match and mirror what others around us are doing. And we've been doing that since we were very young. So if everyone is rushing around and avoiding eye contact, patients are gonna feel that stress. But if the tone of the entire team, doctors, nurses, administrators, parking attendants, cleaning staff, is warm and relaxed and friendly, the patients are gonna feel that as well and be put at ease. Plus, it costs nothing, it's not gonna cause any delays, and there's no known side effects. Now, I understand that doctors and nurses often work long hours, and they can be overworked, but I hope they can find just that little bit of extra energy to look up, make eye contact, and smile, maybe say hi, especially now that we know that this is part of a team effort to extend bedside manners beyond the bed. It's not just doable, it's happening. The Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh has already implemented this basic 3-1 strategy as official policy. Another, the other one is avoid finding ways to saying no to patients whenever possible. There's a big difference between saying, no, I'm not gonna give you antibiotics, and instead saying, well, I looked at your test results, and the good news is, looks like you get to skip antibiotics this time, which is great news because they'll be more effective if you ever need them in the future, right? And finally, medical professionals need to learn how to handle like, complaints like service professionals. Sorry is a word that everyone on your team needs to learn, and it's incredible how effective it is. Sorry we couldn't see you today. Sorry we couldn't get you rebooked next week. Sorry you had to sit next to a dead plant. The important thing is to try not to get defensive when they point out something that wasn't your fault. Instead, take their side immediately and with empathy, right? Instead of, that's not my responsibility or I can't help you, maybe say, well, that sounds frustrating. I'm gonna see if I can find someone right now to see if they can help you with that. And let's not forget, many of these service issues are grounded right in the word patient itself. Patient is Latin, and it means to suffer. And it's as passive as it sounds. Patients are, by definition, supposed to just lay there and tolerate whatever health care gets thrown their way. Which is why some have begun to argue that maybe a good first step would be to find a better word for them. But whatever we end up calling these healthcare recipients, reducing the pain points that cause stress, greeting them, making eye contact, learning to say sorry when we need to, that's not just good communication or even good customer service. In healthcare, that counts as compassion. And we know from research that compassion works. Even as little as 40 seconds of it during a visit makes a positive difference. Compassion reduces anxiety. Compassion gets people to follow their doctor's advice better. Compassion gets patients to seek medical advice when they need it most. It's not more complicated than that. If it seems a little trivial or maybe not like real health care, keep, keep in mind that's exactly how we used to feel about mental health, nursing, and physical therapy. It may not be part of an overall strategy yet, but we are starting to see hospitals and clinics take some small steps in this direction already, a sign that this might be the beginning of a global movement, the flutter of a butterfly's wings. The real trick here is to rethink our approach to strategic patient service. Patient service that fits in the same category as bedside manners. Patient service that is a smart and cost-effective investment in better health care for everyone. Thank you.